Uh, we are absolutely delighted to kick this off with the head of the Information Warfare Community, Vice Admiral Kelly Ashback, who is the commander of Naval Information Forces. She's a graduate of George Washington University and was commissioned through the NROTC program and has been a career Naval Intelligence Officer. I'm not going to read all of her commands and where she's been and all that. It's too numerous to mention. Uh, but I will mention that she has commanded at the, the 06 level, I believe it was, with the Naval Communi Computer and Telecommunications Area Master Station Atlantic in Norfolk. And as a flag officer, she served as Deputy Director of Intelligence for U.S. Forces Afghanistan, Director of Intelligence for U.S. Strategic Command at Offutt, Director of National Maritime Intelligence Integration Office and the Commander, Office of Naval Intelligence, before assuming her current role. With that, ma'am, over to you. Uh, good morning. It's, uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces, and uh, I think as many commented on yesterday, uh, really fantastic um, to be able to be here in person. Uh, I think I've shared with more than a few folks, I came last year uh, to the San Diego area in June, but I did my panel presentation from my hotel room uh, because of the limitations, and so it's been really refreshing to have the opportunity to, uh, to catch up with so many folks and plus meet uh, so many of our, uh, our partners uh, in information warfare here this week. I, I did want to extend a thank you to Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence uh, and also to Vice Admiral Pete Daly um, for hosting this event and particularly for embracing information warfare uh, I think many of you have seen uh, that the pavilion uh, is really tremendous. I would encourage you, if you haven't had the chance yet, to spend time in the pavilion uh, outside the speaking engagements. Uh, please take advantage of that. We have a, a lot of our young talent, uh, civilian and sailor, uh, with us uh, this week um, who are much uh, better versed uh, in what we're doing in terms of capabilities, training, operations, et cetera. And so I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to talk to them uh, 1v1. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to uh, Tammy Goring, uh, who is with AFSIA, but has worked really closely with our Information Warfare PAO team uh, and uh, really helped bring all of this together. And so I also think the opportunity for us uh, in terms of uh, strategic communications and all the great press, an uh, opportunity to get our message out has been uh, really well supported. Uh, and so uh, thankful for that. Um, I also uh, you know, thank uh, Joe for the introduction. I was laughing as he was trying to pronounce Nick Tam's land. Uh, and uh, I will share a little story about the journey we've been on in information warfare. But I was in the first tranche of, uh, of IW officers who had the chance to cross detail and command. And so I got the chance to go run a communication station as an intel officer. And at the time, uh, Admiral Rogers uh, was, my, uh, was my boss. Uh, and he was very enthusiastic about how uh, the cross-pollination of information warfare officers was really going to benefit the enterprise, help bring different perspective. But the very first thing he says to me is, Kelly, you need to change that name, Nick Tamsland, because I, I can't even pronounce, I don't even know what the acronym is. You need to, you need to change that. And I, and I said, well, sir, I, I'm very excited to go down there, but I know there's some anxiety on the part of my my uh, brothers and sisters in information professional uh, community on whether I'm really qualified, you know, to take that job. I said, I don't think it would be prudent for me to walk in and propose changing the name, you know, on day one. Uh, and so uh, notably, it's still Nick Tamslam, which I'm actually really partial to having served there. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but just, uh, you know, something about where we've come from uh, and, uh, and, and in some ways how many years it's been since I had the opportunity to do that. Um, but anyway, um, I wanted to take a little bit of time today to talk about uh, a little bit more about information warfare. For those of you who were at the panel yesterday, I think some of my remarks uh, uh, will be an opportunity to reinforce some of the same points. Uh, some of you saw Admiral Vernazza uh, yesterday, uh, and I'll echo some of the things he had to say. But I really wanted to reserve much of the time for your uh, questions, uh, so hopefully uh, I won't uh, um, talk uh, too long. Uh, but you can see up here, I've got a slide up here which depicts um, how we see information warfare today. And I mentioned yesterday that, um, as many of you know, information warfare is integral um, to everything we do in the Department of Defense, uh, tactical, operational, strategic. Um, and I would argue it's the best profession to be in. Uh, we have our own warfighting capability, uh, which is incredibly exciting, but no other warfighter can execute their mission without us. You can't go into any mission area without some component of information warfare if you expect to have success. And so that makes what we do really powerful. 
And then if you think about where we are as a country right now, from a national security perspective, what we value in terms of our freedoms, what we're trying to promote uh, in terms of the economic prosperity, the Navy is vital to all of that. So not only are we in information warfare, and no offense to my other service counterparts, but we're also in the best service. Uh, we will be central going forward to anything that happens in competition. And we play a vital role, hopefully, in deterring conflict. Um, but if it ever comes to that, we also play a vital role in ensuring that we will uh, deliver victory um, in whatever conflict uh, occurs. And so I, uh, I think that's incredibly energizing. Uh, and uh, it does bring me my greatest challenge was, is the fact that we're in demand. Uh, and that, uh, and we can't meet that demand fast enough uh, is really our, our biggest problem. So a good problem to have, um, but as we talked about yesterday, it feels like we just can't move fast enough um, to deliver uh, what we're doing. Um, I did want to highlight again that our traditional pillars for information warfare uh, do remain about assuring command and control, which is essential uh, to distributed maritime operations. Uh, we're also about enhancing battle space awareness uh, another vital component, especially if you're going to have distributed forces on how we ensure everybody understands what's happening from the tactical to the operational to the strategic at any one period in time. And then we are vital to integrating fires, whether that's delivering our own fires in terms of non-kinetic capability or helping others deliver kinetic fires. Uh, you can't execute that kill chain uh, without uh, information warfare. And so all of that maneuver uh, rests on our shoulders in terms of how we do it successfully through the spectrum, um, but through all the rest of the domains from the seabed all the way up to space. Um, so again, I think uh, really exciting. And for those of you who are in industry or partnering with us, uh, hopefully energizing to you in terms of the potential application of what you're working on, how we're going to be able to integrate uh, your uh, technical capabilities, and how you help us, frankly, meet some of our uh, most uh, pressing requirements. So I wanted to talk a little bit about large-scale exercise 2021, which occurred uh, last summer, because uh, we had the opportunity during that to demonstrate the importance of information warfare um, and the role it plays um, across the uh, naval force. In a really fantastic way, that exercise tested and validated the integration that we've been working on um, in bringing our capabilities on the focus we have on maximizing lethality. Uh, and particularly for uh, Mike Vernaz's team and our Warfighting Development Center, it really helped inform what they're doing in terms of the doctrinal development and allowed us to uh, demonstrate some of our uh, um, uh, innovative uh, capabilities, new things we're trying to deliver, but also really allowed us to test out some of the doctrine we've already developed so we could do some refinement uh, and really allow the operators to see the extent uh, of the uh, capability and capacity uh, we can br bring. And this particular problem was really focused at the strike group level. So for us, it really solidified the journey we've been on with the Information Warfare Commander, uh, the progress we made there. We're really excited uh, that we're signing out uh, the con ops finally for Information Warfare Commander. I just sent that up to Amal Cottle and Amal Paparo last week for signature. Uh, which uh, I think is uh, capturing the goodness uh, and the uh, superb uh, capability that we're delivering with an Information Warfare Commander now. And you'll have a chance to hear later this morning uh, from Captain Tony Butera, who just came back from uh, deployment as an Information Warfare Commander, uh, and how we're really trying to lever that position uh, in terms of accountability for readiness, uh, ensuring that we've got all the right people, training and equipment before we go, that we've got a single point of advocacy across our groups uh, to make sure that we're holding ourselves uh, and our, um, our uh, partners accountable uh, for that readiness, uh, and that they're ready to go. Uh, and then that leadership in terms of actual execution uh, and turning that doctrine into reality. So, uh, uh, so I think that'll be a great engagement uh, later this morning for you to hear about. The other thing we focused on during LSC, and we're still waiting for the uh, final report, is we are focused now at the operational level of war. Uh, and we have a keen interest in our maritime operational centers across our fleet commands uh, in really coming to a common understanding of what is the role of information warfare at the operational level of war, how do we get a clear definition of what the framework's going to be for how we execute, and then allow us to continue to make the progress, not just at the tactical level, but up at the operational level on how we integrate uh, information warfare. Um, and we do see that operational piece as, uh, as really vital because it's at that level that you really see the linkage with information warfare across distributed forces. 
Only at the operational level can you really look across um, all of the entities that we will hopefully have in play uh, in, uh, in crisis. Um, and we are positioned, again, to help uh, bring that warfighting advantage, because at that operational level, if we have information warfare integrated uh, correctly, we're going to be able to close the kill chain faster. And then we're going to ensure that we deliver lethality in the right place, and that we move our forces uh, into the best position so that they're resilient, uh, they can recover, they can reset if they need to, and they can get back uh, into the fight. And part of that, as I talked about yesterday, is the work that NAVWAR is doing in delivering the Navy operational architecture that we need uh, and the project overmatch work that's ongoing to give us resilience across all of our sensors and our architecture so that everything's connected in a way uh, that it's agnostic about how it's delivered. Uh, and that we can move it rapidly uh, via whatever the open path is to get it there fastest. And we're pressing really hard with everyone to work on how we transition to that and how we focus more on software solutions uh, that would give us the agility um, to integrate all the fantastic uh, progress that folks are making technically much faster uh, than we've been able to do in the past when we've been wedded to a hardware solution. Uh, so I really think a, a lot of reasons to be optimistic um, about, uh, about what we do. But I'd be remiss in all of that if I really didn't talk about the most important part uh, in all of information warfare, uh, which is our people. And, uh, and I mentioned yesterday, I do sleep very well at night because we have really talented people. Um, and, uh, and I don't lose, yeah, lose any sleep and knowing that there are folks uh, more exceptional, more qualified, smarter than me already coming up uh, in the Navy. And in fact, I talked to some of them yesterday, and I do have that moment where I pause and think, how the heck did I get into this business? Uh, when you look at the caliber of the folks uh, and the talent that we have integrated today, it's, uh, it's really reassuring. But the reason I wake up at night, though, is I'm concerned that we aren't moving fast enough to effectively train them. Uh, that we are not always giving them uh, the best, most ready equipment, uh, and we really aren't affording them the opportunity uh, when we are arming them with great equipment. We really don't give them the space, the time uh, they need to maximize their innovation against that capability. Uh, and I am concerned that some of the capabilities we have in some ways are actually underutilized, or I don't think we actually know the full potential of some of what we have in the fleet. Um, because of the compressed training timelines, and again, for us, the challenge that a lot of the things we do, we can't actually demonstrate for real. You know, we have to do it notionally, we have to make some assumptions uh, about what we do, and so um, we, uh, we're hopeful that's going to change uh, over time as we continue to uh, progress with the improvements in training. But the demand for our people is coming from everywhere. And so I mentioned the Information Warfare Commander. We do have those with the strike groups. We also are fielding folks with amphibious ready groups now. And uh, in our integration with the Marine Corps, the Marines have also committed to full-time position now in charge of what they call operations in the information environment. And so for the last couple of ARG deployments off both coasts, we've had an 05 from Information Warfare and an 04 uh, from the Marine Corps leading the integration of uh, information warfare across the amphibious ready group. And the feedback from the leaders who go out on those deployments has been resounding that that has been incredibly powerful. Uh, and so we're committed to working with uh, the surface warfare community on how we turn uh, that position into a permanent one uh, and maintain that integration. We also um, are working with the submarine force, and I was uh, disappointed that Admiral Houston, who was originally supposed to be here on the panel with me yesterday, couldn't make the trip. But he has been a superb partner, and coming in as the new head of the submarine force, uh, he fully embraces information warfare, so much so uh, that he is carving out billets from within the submarine force to pilot uh, permanent party information warfare on board submarines much like we've done for years with supply officers on board submarines. Uh, Admiral Houston uh, is rightly concerned that the complexity of what we face now uh, under the sea is demanding enough that having his full-time submarine officers do information warfare part-time uh, is probably insufficient and approached me about uh, embracing our information warfare expertise and allowing our folks to deliver exactly what they should uh, is excellence in information warfare in support uh, of, a, of a submarine. And so we will be piloting, starting this summer, uh, two pilots on two submarines where we're going to have a junior officer. Uh, one of them will be an information professional, one will be a cryptologist, and they will be accompanied by three full-time sailors 
Uh, we'll have an independent duty intelligence specialist and then two cryptologic technicians who will bring permanent capacity. And this will be in addition to what we do in terms of specialized direct support for our submarines. We still will train to provide temporary support for very specialized missions. But this permanent party is hopefully going to prove out the value of us being integrated in the uh, very unique undersea environment. Uh, and as Admiral Houston and I have discussed, um, you know, only the Navy excels under the sea. Uh, and only information warfare in the Navy excels at providing battle space awareness, integrated fires, and assured communications under the sea. No one else is going to do that for you, and so I think it's a really valued partnership and certainly excited about where, uh, where we're going with that. And then I mentioned the Maritime Operations Centers, uh, where we are moving out uh, on the integration of information warfare. And I would say that integration is already happening. What we're working on now is how do we bring better definition to it, uh, which would allow me, as the type commander, to really focus on the type of trained individuals that I need to provide, would allow us to refine exactly what information warfare-related equipment uh, that we need uh, inside of uh, the mock and again, allow us to further develop uh, the doctrine, tactics, techniques that go with executing at the operational level. Um, so really important work. That is complemented um, by the initiative that Amal Paparo uh, tasked me with when I came in last year. He took command of PAC fleet uh, about the same time that I took command of Naval Information Forces. Uh, uh, and in a really good way for me, he reached out. I think I'd been in the job about two weeks. And he said, hey, Kelly, I want to get your thoughts on information warfare in the Pacific. Um, and, uh, and I told him, you know, my vision uh, was that we would have lead integrators in all the mocks, that we would dedicate capacity full time uh, to how we deliver information warfare to create that decision space at the operational level. Uh, and what that turned into was frankly more than I expected. Uh, Admiral Paparo did task us to establish an information warfare task force out in the Pacific. And so we've been working on that with uh, PAC Fleet since last summer. We demonstrated that capability during the Global Series exercise in November. Uh, we worked on it again in January as part of Keen Edge. And I'm very excited to say we will be sending a Navy IW flag officer out uh, to lead that effort, uh, starting in the May-June time frame, hopefully, uh, with a small group carved out from the PAC fleet staff that will grow that into uh, a permanent task force underneath Admiral Paparo in support uh, of his uh, operational requirements out in the Pacific. Uh, and so we think that'll be a force multiplier. We already have fantastic, superb capability delivered by Fleet Cyber Command 10th Fleet uh, in terms of the cyber and space uh, that they bring, especially as part of the joint force under Indo-PACOM. Uh, uh, but this will allow focused and dedicated articulation of requirements uh, for the Navy commander uh, in theater, and I think also really allow us to accelerate in information operations and how we gain control of the narrative relative to the activities we have going on in the Pacific. Um, so another, uh, I think, really positive initiative. And all of that going on with our folks, um, we've had great partnering uh, with uh, the Center for Information Warfare Training uh, down in Pensacola, also with Navy Postgraduate School, uh, and then with our direct accession sources, uh, particularly the Naval Academy, and how they are pacing us uh, in terms of the work they're doing to train our new accessions, but also partnering with us, particularly in the case of Naval Postgraduate School, on how we leverage the students to get after some of our hardest problems. And so we are excited on how we're going to move forward uh, on that. And then I, I did want to mention again live virtual constructive training. I talked about it a lot yesterday, um, but I, I can't overemphasize how important I see that. Um, the delivery of that capability in terms of us allowing to really reach uh, where we need to be in information warfare. Um, and for some of you who've been in the exercise environment in the past, uh, been in a training environment, uh, I think you're very well versed if you were an information warfare specialist, um, that we often um, have to take a back seat to the objectives of what's happening in a training environment in order to allow things to happen on schedule or we have to white card stuff because we don't have the connectivity or the capability to really demonstrate stuff uh, in true form. Uh, and so I've been uncomfortable, especially with the increasing complexity of what we do, um, that we are guessing about what we're delivering. Um, and as most humans are, we tend, I think, to be rightly optimistic about how awesome we will be uh, in conflict when we deliver all of that capability. 
Um, but I'm uncomfortable that we could be wrong in some areas. I, I also think we could be underestimating, frankly, how impactful uh, we may actually be in some areas. And then I do think as uh, Amal Trussler and the N2N6 team continue to deliver against our programmed capabilities, that we need an environment where we can see what's going on concurrently. Because we are at risk, I think, of some fratricide um, in the spectrum. Uh, and we also may have the ability to bring even more compelling effects um, through the innovation of our sailors and the concurrent use of some of these capabilities that we actually don't fully understand yet. Uh, and so we are really pressing hard on live virtual constructive. Uh, we're in our third pilot, I think, this month. Uh, the benchmark this month is that we actually are going to get the SCI, TS, highest classification level feed into the system. Uh, we have connected some of our information warfare systems to that, and we're going to continue to try and prove that out this year. And then we're working with the broader Navy on how do we prioritize the mission areas we want to deliver from a training perspective uh, in LVC. And so there's discussion now about how we prioritize things uh, like long-range fires, like counter C5 ISR and T, and how do we ensure we've got all the representation from the various uh, Navy entities that would contribute to that mission replicated in LVC in a timely way so we can actually uh, uh, train to it. Um, so, uh, so very exciting, and, uh, and we're complementing that, as Admiral Vernazza talked about yesterday, with the training of our warfighting tactics instructors. Uh, and I think he mentioned the number yesterday, and I actually had to pause for a minute. It's like almost 150 now, right? But when we graduate this upcoming class. And I would say for the size of information warfare, uh, that's pretty impressive how far we've come uh, in a relatively short amount of time. I think it's been three or four years that we've been producing witties. Um, and Captain Butera will tell you when he's here, he had one witty with him out on deployment. And he said one witty is like having 12 you know, IW um, uh, personnel in terms of uh, how well they're trained, the capability they bring, the enthusiasm and innovation. Um, and so we're leaning in on that. We're on the cusp of actually identifying which billets will have permanent witties in them, which is focused mostly on our warfighting development centers and our training commands. And then we're going to use a uh, detailing distribution process to ensure that every strike group going forward has a minimum number of witties integrated uh, so we can maximize uh, that execution at the tactical level. We're looking at a similar concept at the operational level for our mocks as we get a better definition of what information warfare looks like uh, there. Um, I do want to wrap it up uh, with um, you know, talking again about the partnership that I have with Admiral Trussler as N2N6, our resource sponsor, and with Admiral Doug Small. Uh, who's, uh, who leads NAV War, and uh, together the three of us chair the Information Warfare Enterprise, um, and I think we've been pretty successful at turning that en enterprise into uh, a body that actually produces substantive outcomes. Uh, Tammy North talked yesterday about our C5I wholeness campaign, the efforts we have to continue to instantiate information warfare in the fleet, to get after troubled systems, uh, how we bring wholeness in areas where we missed the mark the first time around and we need to do better, uh, and then how we just accelerate overall everything we're trying to do. And again, Project Overmatch is one of those where I think we've got to be leaning in on not just delivering that capability, but we're already working with our partners on what is the training that's required to execute that successfully. How will we integrate it? How do we get ahead of that and anticipate? Um, and as somebody really in a great way yesterday uh, mentioned yesterday, yeah, what is the minimum viable doctrine and minimal viable training we need for Project Overmatch, I think is a discussion we're already having uh, in new terminology, yeah, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using uh, more frequently. Um, but anyway, with all of that, I, I think um, we're excited to be here this week. We're excited to engage with everybody. We appreciate all the support we're giving uh, everyone. There certainly are a lot of immense challenges. This certainly is a fascinating week to be out at FCA uh, with, with what's going on from a global perspective. Um, but I think in all of that, there's tremendous opportunity and I think a lot of reasons for us to be really positive uh, and excited about the trajectory that we're on. Um, we still bring advantage. We've just got to move fast enough to retain it um, and, uh, and fast enough to harness more of it uh, to create greater advantage um, as, we, uh, as we progress. Um, so I'm going to close there and I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions. So thanks.
Good morning. Uh, thanks for all that information. I was wondering, um, could you just give a, a, a quick snapshot of what, how you're thinking about open source and where you're investing and what the challenges might be? And also, if you could address what, uh, what will look different in two to five years, perhaps, from where we are now. Because it's such a huge resource and challenge and impacts everything from analysis to collection to the, you know, literally the whole enterprise. Now, I, I think that's a, a great question. I'll have to be uh, candid up front that um, it might be a better question for Admiral Trussler than for me, because I think candidly the Navy is actually still um, discussing what our strategy is and how we want to execute with open source. Um, when I was at uh, Office of Naval Intelligence and Command there, um, we had a number of initiatives underway on how we harness open source, how we integrate publicly available information, um, but we hadn't yet settled, and I think we're still talking across Navy on what are everybody's responsibilities relative to that. And I would tell you down at the TICOM level, um, we are not yet moving, at least based on fleet requirements. Um, I don't think we've coalesced uh, really firmly around an open source uh, requirement. I think we recognize the value of open source and publicly available information, but I don't think it's come up in a way yet um, that we've been passionately talking about, that we either need training, new system, new integration. I do think that the Information Warfare Task Force in the Pacific and Almo Paparo's press for us to really get after information advantage, I think it's going to drive or accelerate that we're going to have to talk again about how we harness that, um, how do we provide or field the capabilities in the right places so that folks can uh, gather and take advantage of that information. Um, and then what are the rule sets for how we publish? I was mentioning to someone yesterday that when we had to go to telework under COVID, it was a little bit of a surprise at Office of Naval Intelligence. I think people just kind of thought they could go home and they, you know, free reign on the internet. You know, you could look at whatever and you might still be able to write a nice unclassified assessment. Well, there's actually a whole lot of governance and oversight that goes uh, with our intelligence uh, uh, practices and the ethics of how we write stuff and the research that we do. Um, and we actually discovered that uh, there, there needs to be some over oversight and governance on individuals going out. And are they on a, commercial, on a, a personal computer? Are they on a, a government-sponsored com computer? And then how do we uh, integrate that? And so in a good way, I think COVID also has driven for the intelligence community discussion again about What's the governance? You know, how do you write on that? So not a very satisfactory answer, I think, because I do recognize the importance uh, of the information. But, uh, but I would say, I think, as Navy, we, we've been, I think, waiting for some others to make some decisions in some cases. And then I think probably in a good way, having a pretty healthy debate about does there need to be a specific lead or how do we integrate training and awareness across uh, all of our specialties on that one? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for being here. I uh, really appreciate hearing your insights. Um, you talked earlier about not being able to meet demand fast enough. Is that a data ingestion issue, data sharing, pulling information, and getting intelligence out of information? What do you attribute to that? How does that get through? So my, my initial concern with meeting demand fast enough is I, I literally can't produce um, talented people at the right rank fast enough to get them into a position. Or I don't actually have a have a position yet because we, we know we need information warfare, but we hadn't yet defined what's the billet structure or the investment that we're going to make. So the first part is, yeah, ha actually literally having the right leadership or talent. Um, then after that comes knowing that they're needed. Uh, and I'll use the example of the information warfare commander where um, I feel now like we can't move fast enough on how do we get after defining the space requirements on the carrier for what information warfare should look like now that we have a full-time commander and we'd like to integrate all of those information warfare capabilities ideally in a single skiffed space with uh, special access. Um, those of you who've been on a carrier know it's compartmented, physically compartmented in a way um, that precludes some of the integration that we'd, ha we'd like to have. You have to move physically from one space to another. And in fact, on Ford, it's fascinating because it's uh, configurable, reconfigurable, which has actually created new challenges for us in terms of policy of how you skiff a space 
because we created it in a way that the integrity of the, the walls and stuff that move around uh, didn't necessarily meet the administrative requirement. I mean, all these things that we learn as we progress, and none of them are insurmountable, um, but the kind of issues that uh, where we're moving too slowly. Uh, and then, yeah, the training piece. I think we actually are doing a pretty good job pacing or identifying equipment to meet our requirements. We still keep falling short of the mark or the sweet spot on when do we need to bring the training in? And, uh, and we have a, uh, a process where we hold off delivering full training right away while we're integrating a new capability. And we, I think, are misjudging uh, when that training needs to fall in. And so Slick32 is a great example right now where we went to version six and we guessed on where that, that uh, spot needed to be. Then we accelerated installation and now we're woefully behind on providing full-time training. And so, so that's where I feel like we can't keep pace. Uh, so it's in a number of areas, but it's the starting point is, um, in a good way, everybody wants us to be a part of the team. Uh, and so when we do show up, then how do we get an infrastructure, training, and all that other stuff around it faster uh, is, uh, is the challenge. Hi, ma'am. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, minimum viable doctrine, minimum viable uh, training, so I'm from the software world, uh, MVP, definitely part of our way of thinking. It strikes me that uh, on the open source question and use in LVC, you talked about having uh, TSSCI later in the year, maybe minimum viable all source integration might be a training uh, component of, uh, of the LVC and have that way of thinking uh, help to define uh, early best mm -hmm. use of open source so that you're not taking it from a holistic, let's boil the ocean, we got to solve the big open yeah. source issue mm -hmm. and instead find what's useful through mm -hmm. training. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I'm, I'm looking at Amal Vernazza, hoping he's taking notes on that one. On that one. <laughs> but no, thanks. Good morning, ma'am. Um, so there was a panel yesterday that mentioned the Jupyter Enterprise data environment. I was just curious if uh, that is the environment that Project Overmatch is tracking towards for big data analytics. You know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I am familiar with Jupyter because we're working on, a, on a ways in which we uh, uh, track and visualize readiness. And uh, we had piloted a number of things and it does appear we're coalescing um, around the use of Jupyter. Um, but I, I don't have the answer on, on where exactly that fits in, uh, in Project Overmatch. Um, I would expect that the way Project Overmatch is designed, that it, it, if we've made a decision that Jupiter is going to be a backbone or fundamental to something, it will be integrated at some point. Um, the intent is, I mean, that is what Project Overmatch is supposed to deliver, is that surety that we can connect everything. But I, I apologize, I don't know the details on that one. Hey, good morning, man. Uh, where do you see the, um, the Navy in using uh, mobile devices or getting a mobile device in uh, all the sailors' hands uh, to do the training or to just have that connectivity with what's going on and uh, situational awareness? Um, I, I do think um, there are a lot of good initiatives to empower sailors, um, especially as it relates to uh, taking care of themselves, how they track their pay, how they do medical uh, via their mobile devices, and appealing to them on a, on a platform uh, that they've grown up with or used to interfacing with. Um, I do think that also has created challenges for us operationally, and we continue to work through from an operational security perspective and uh, own signature, own force monitoring, um, how those are integrated um, in our on our ships uh, and when we operate. We've come up with um, some pretty effective policies and procedures for how we still empower sailors uh, to access mobile devices. Um, but I'll be candid, I think we continue to learn every time on how that may negatively impact us. Um, but I think we're gonna continue to have to navigate, especially if we're committed to resilience and redundancy, how we still um, integrate that kind of mobile capability and not exclude it uh, from the suite of uh, things that we're doing. And so there are um, investments uh, to allow, especially carrier strike groups, to connect in a way that facilitates the use of mobile when you're in the right environment. Um, and I think even our exploration on what mobile might be able to do for us um, in, uh, uh, in uh, actual operational uh, effectiveness or delivery of capability. So, um, so I, think, uh, I think it's a good move. It's been well received by the sailor 
dollars in terms of day-to-day -day what they can do, but we have gotten the feedback that, yeah, when you actually get on the ship and you're operating, if we don't have another way for them to connect, um, you know, how, what, how do we assure that they can get their pay if they can't check it on their mobile device? And so, uh, so all challenges we continue to, uh, to work through. Well, hey, thanks, everybody. I appreciate all the time this morning and uh, look forward to uh, hopefully seeing more of you here uh, during, the, uh, during the week.